Our scripture reading this morning comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. If, then, there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but himself he was empty, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to, to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How many Christians does it take to change a light bulb? This is a trick question. It depends. And so let me, let me preface these one-liners with saying, uh, I love Christians of all stripes, and these are stereotypes, and I say this in jest, and they would do the same of me. How many Calvinists does it take to change a light bulb? None. The light will go on and off when it is predestined to do so. <laughs> How many Southern Baptists does it take to change a light bulb? Three to five is the answer. A one to change the bulb, and the rest to prepare the, the salad and the chicken and the, the meal thereafter. How many Pentecostal Christians does it take to change a light bulb? Ten. One to change the light bulb, and nine to pray against the spirit of darkness. And how many Unitarians? The Unitarians choose not to make a statement in, in favor nor against the need of light bulbs. However, if in your own journey you have found that light bulbs work for you, you're invited to share your personal expression of light bulbs at their next service. How many Missouri Synod Lutherans? I know many from my last work in Missouri. How many Missouri Synod Lutherans does it take to change light bulb? Change? And how many Presbyterians? At least 15. One to change the bulb, one committee to review and approve the change, another committee to approve the cost, and a third committee will study the luminary injustice of such an event. This may or may not grow in number depending on whether or not General Assembly chooses to take up the discussion. <laughs> These jokes, uh, and, and there are many, many, many more variations of them, let me tell you. Go to Google. Uh, they're funny because they're amped up stereotypes of Christian traditions. What was fascinating to me to think about uh, is that these used to be very prominent stereotypes across the country. 50 to 70 years ago, uh, when over 90 percent of the American population identified as one stripe of Christian or another, Today, however, that stereotype, these traditions, are starting to get lost. They're starting to get lost because there's fewer Christians in those churches. Cultural changes in all of these denominations could be part of it, I suspect, but 
there's a decrease in participation. And now, with less than 60% of Americans claiming one stripe of Christianity or another, those stereotypes are starting to slow. They're starting to fade. Preacher knows how to kill a mood, doesn't he? I've got a point to make, so stick with me. Philippians, our, our passage this morning, this is a letter from Paul, letter of encouragement, a letter of guidance to a church that is in need of encouragement. This is one of Paul's last letters to that church, and he knows this, and it, it's clear if you read the entire passage, if you, or the entire letter, rather. If you think about you're writing some final words, the last thing you want someone to remember before you leave, what are those things that you're going to tell them? You're not going to tell them, don't forget to turn off the lights, don't forget to do this. You're going to say the bigger thematic things of life. Live with joy. Your life will be so much better if you live with joy. That's basically all of chapter 4. This passage, chapter 2, Paul says to the people of God in Philippi, do anything, anything that compels you to unity in Christ. If you find something that brings you together, dwell on that. He then quotes liturgy. And so in uh, verses 6 through 11, there's, uh, let me pull that real quick. Verses 6 through 11, he says, uh, though Jesus was in the form of God, did not require equality with God, something to be exploited. And it turns pretty theologically heavy for a couple of verses. This is a passage that everyone would have been familiar with. These are words that churches across the, uh, the known world, there weren't a whole lot of them yet, but churches and Christians knew these words. They would have almost started saying them with him as these words were being read to the congregation from Paul. And he does this very intentionally. These are important words to the congregation, like a hymn that's been sung over and over again. And he calls them back to these words, these words of faith, like an Apostles' Creed, if you will. Words that unite people across traditions and across disagreements. Whatever you need to do to find unity in Christ, dwell on these things. These things tie us, they connect us all. And he does this using these words, and they were likely part of a song, which again, art, music, creative expressions of our faith, draw us together. If these are the words of Paul, Paul the evangelist, Paul the man who traveled around the known world to do the work of proclaiming the gospel and of telling others about this good news, having seen and done all the things that he has, they're words to live by then. So, my light bulb joke may have been just really working against what Paul wants us to do. If we're trying to find unity in the church, maybe we shouldn't be poking, dif poking fun at the differences that we have. How should we embody this? What should we do in order to live out this unifying presence, this unifying call for the church? Let's go back to the, top, the topic of churches. As the number of practicing Christians in this country has declined, congregations have begun to close their doors. Uh, congregations have been dissolving. Every, uh, in my previous work, I was working with presbyteries. Presbytery meetings that I would go to always had a congregation closing or an uh, administrative commission that was formed to discuss another congregation moving out of the denomination. And for those of us who have memories of congregational life dating back to the 50s and 60s or even the 80s and 90s, this can be distressing. 
After World War II, churches were places that families found community. It's where they found resources. It is where families that didn't, had lost a father or lost a husband in the war could find a community in which they could grow and find support. Presbyterian churches in particular were hotbeds for, uh, for communities and individuals in particular seeking political influence. If you wanted to be the lawyer, a big lawyer in town, if you wanted to be the, the mayor of town, you likely went to First or Central Presbyterian Church of your city. If you really wanted to get good, get impressive you know, notoriety in town, you taught Sunday school. Remember that. Churches were the center of life. Churches were so full, the choirs would sing and you'd hear the rattling of the stained glass. And even in smaller churches, as the children were summoned forward for the children's message, a slow tremor would begin of movement until Jurassic Park-like earthquake would happen as little feet stomped down the aisles and gathered, congregated at the front. If these are your memories, churches bursting at the seams, it can feel like church has been let down today. However, if these, if these realities bring you any sense of despair or hopelessness or fear, stop and walk my journey with me. <clears throat> I began parish ministry or began studying for parish ministry about 15 years ago in the thick of the churches are closing, the churches are closing. I had a job with benefits. I knew full well what I was getting into. I'm not, I know how to work with money. This, I know this looked like a financially poor decision to go into a field where ministers are not staying in their line of work. But I did it, yes, because of a call, I felt like this is where God was calling me to go. But I did it because I see something in the church that some don't, and I want you to see that too. When I joined the Presbyterian Church in 2010, there was a formal shift happening in what was the leadership of churches across our denomination. 50 years ago, who was running our churches? straight white married men. That is a very specific group of people. We were able to differentiate one another and put ourselves into little corners and into little towers. We weren't a united church that worked together. The Presbyterian church that exists now when I joined the Presbyterian Church was at the exact moment when LGBT ordination became a possibility, when marriage was opened to permit, and let me rephrase that, it wasn't open to permit other people to be married and other people to be ordained. We took away the limitations that we had put on in the 1970s. Rules were made in the 70s to exclude certain people. And in 2010, we then removed those written rules, those added rules. At the age of 24, I was entering a line of work and I was entering a denomination where I was no longer being excluded. The denomination in which I grew up refused to even talk about the LGBT community, the queer members of their denomination, and continue to do so 15 years later. Every year at their General Assembly, it comes up, and every year, my community is told, we will not even consider embracing you. We will not even consider talking about you. You don't exist. 
and the Presbyterian Church was a place of hope for me. The Presbyterian Church is a place where I saw people like me and people not like me working together to do the work that God had called us to do, to allow us to fulfill a call that I had felt so deeply within me that I moved across, I moved into another country, I left everyone and everything I knew because I felt like that's what God was calling me to do. And what really cemented it for me was I went to General Assembly. I was the delegate from Princeton Seminary in 2012 because I was the only one foolish enough to say, this is a good idea. 2012 was a year of the no. The, the General Assembly voted against anything that had to do with change. And that was incredibly frustrating for me, but it was that General Assembly that provided me the hope and the understanding of the Presbyterian identity that made me so faithful to this denomination today. And it is what I see in this church too. I was seated, seated beside some of the most conservative people in the country. I don't know why, and I don't know who's in charge of that seating plan, but at first I was a little upset and I was a little disturbed. But as the week went on and as discussions carried on, we had discussions about everything from Israel and Palestine to uh, pay scales at the mission agency to marriage and just uh, Christian education, everything. And what I saw was people who vastly differed on opinions. <laughs> they were so far apart from mine but yet still called themselves Presbyterian like I did. And while we vehemently disagreed in debate and we voted against one another almost every time, we still enjoyed meals together later. I still learned about who they were and they wanted to know about who I was. I learned about their family, I prayed with them, they prayed with me. And that is what the body of Christ is to me. That is what I saw and that is what I learned in that time. That the church can be a place where people of differing perspectives can come together and where amazing work gets done and lives are changed. It takes time and it takes effort, a lot of effort and so much patience. But together, the work of the church can get done, and at the end of the day, we can still be part of the same family, whether we disagree or not. It doesn't give us permission to be loosey-goosey and you know, free-flowing free with the grace and joy and love, and I, it does, but we do have to have some moral ethics and some things that we stick to. But if we work together, we can find a place where we can agree that our limits can be, where we find a way forward. And it is in those places that creativity and ministry, which we take vows when we become ordained ministers to work with intelligence, imagination, and love. And that takes work. And it is in those places where people of differing opinions can come together and find a way forward that the most incredible things do happen. So, World Communion Sunday is a day when we do, when we are reminded, when we are told to be reminded, that we come across, we come together at a table from across the world and we come together at a table across cultures. And sometimes it's the people that are in the same room as us that are so far away from us that we need to be joined with the most. And so World Communion Sunday is one way that we do that. It's a way that we come together. It's a way that we come together in this room. It's a way that we come together in the church and remember that the body of Christ as far flung as we are, are still all children of God. 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, distinctly three and perfectly one. Amen.